I know there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of electrodynamism that you've all been having in conversation. I'm here to try to convey a little bit of that. My name is Jose Gonzalez, I'm the founder of Latino Outdoors, among other things. And I have the distinct pleasure of having half an hour to condense all the beautiful magic that you've been talking about for the past two days. Um, a couple of things that I want to honor and request, first of all, it's really expressed the gratitude and appreciation for all the hard work and uh, lifting that everybody has done. I think that one of the, as we were going around trying to collect your takeaways and your three action steps for each of the groups, part of the unreadiness, if you will, about well, what do we have to share? Is it ready? Is it concrete? Can, can we do it? Can you come back in half an hour? Can you come back? No. <laughs> is that I think there were so many active and engaging conversations. You had a lot that you were going through. And that's a lot to do and accomplish, uh, not really over two days, because if you break down the hours, it was really about a day or less. So give yourself a big round of applause and congratulations to yourself. The second thing is an appreciation for all of you, as, you, as I often say, that uh, think of your time. You can always choose to be anywhere else uh, doing this, but time is our most precious currency because you get to choose how to spend it. And you have spent two days doing it here. Uh, and the big themes, the big takeaways that we're trying to distill into implementable actions, into steps, things to do, we always have things to do. What we always want to know is how we're grounding in reasons and purpose to do them. So I want to start by reading you a little something, and then I'm going to go through some of the ideas and themes and strands that I saw and noticed uh, from the different notes, the conversations, uh, and what you were able to share with me. This is from a book called Other Ways of Knowing, Recharting Our Future with Ageless Wisdom by John Boone. A collaborative work in progress. From native peoples, we learn that the path of wisdom lies in opening ourselves to these other forms. Mitakuye o yasin. To all my relations, as the Kodas you say with reverence. The four leggeds, the eight leggeds, those that crawl and those that swim, our feathered friends and green relatives, the waters and the winds. Grandfather Sky and Grandmother Earth. Indigenous traditions also teach that boundaries between forms are not as impermeable as they may seem. By, quote, shifting shapes, unquote, to enter the eagle's keen eye, the bear's great strength, or the flame's searing heat, the shaman shows us passageways to the spirit wisdom of every natural form. The great good news that shamans also bring us is that we are not alone. On a planet that is everywhere alive, conscious, and inspirited, humans have many wise allies for counsel and aid. We should lay to rest our, exagger our exaggerated fears that we do not have the resources to keep this show going. Equally, we must learn humility. The hubris of Homo sapiens in claiming superiority over all other species has been the source of severe damage. Humanity is merely one spirit form among countless millions. By Gary Snyder, as the cricket's soft autumn's hum is to us, so are we to the trees as they are to the rocks and the hills. So connecting and weaving. We are using those words a lot. Um, and I want to read that to you because ultimately this idea of connection is based on relationship. This space happens to be one of the most dynamic spaces in which we find ourselves in because we get really excited about who's in the room. It's one of the few spaces that you get to see familiar faces. Uh, and we saw that expressed in all the smiles and like, oh, you're here too. And it's like, where else am I going to run into so many of you in this space? So that speaks to the strength and power of connections and relationships in what we weave together. 
So some of the things that we've been weaving together, that we've been trying to voice and put into words and to try to literally put on paper, of like, what do we do collectively, um, has been some of these things. So here's a Children in Nature Network relato, or a short story based over the two days. We started with some framing questions, which was, what will move the movement? Which is you, it's us, and then those not here. How do we do this collectively in our, and, and also in our respective strengths? It isn't just you as the individual, so what do you do if you're a grassroots leader, if you're a next-gen leader, if you're working on school yards, if you're working on city policy, but also within that community and within the network and then expanding from that. And then importantly, what we were able to even much more explicitly and concretely state with this summit is how do we do this with equity in process and or outcome for a more inclusive nature movement? And expanding and being clear and explicit, what do those words mean? With action steps, we need to know what those actually look like. What do they feel like? What do they sound like? And keeping in mind that through this process, we were engaged in a social-emotional space. There were feelings involved. There was expressions. We just weren't here connected to each other because of the work. As a good friend and mentor of Annie Burke says, you know, part of the thing that's different about this group is that you're here because you care. And it sounds silly, but in other spaces you're there because that's your job. It's because it's your title. Here it doesn't matter if you're a librarian, if you work at a school, if you started your own nonprofit, if you work for city government, you can come from so many different titles and jobs, but you're here because you care. You care about children, you care about nature, you care about where those reside in relation to each other, from family and community, and you're here to do that. And part of how we're trying to make this work is the power of networks. Because if we just rely on organizations alone, you know that's not enough. If we're trying to do this merely as individuals, it's not enough. So the power of networks, and especially network weaving, as we've been learning and growing and sharing with each other, is to allow us to have a broader collective impact. To know that what we do as an individual is amplified through the power of a network that then allows a movement to move forward, and with that we can implement change greater than we sometimes can visualize, dream, or know that it's what we actually need to actualize. That is you being the pebble and the ripple and the pond creating the wave that then makes that change. While also recognizing that perhaps not all ripples are given the same opportunity, not all stones are given the same opportunity, and so equity and inclusion is to guide us about remembering what's missing, who's missing, why are they not included, and how are we at a loss uh, for that power and potential that those individuals, those voices in the communities bring to the table. That question came up a lot about who are we? Who's the we? We have to say we need to develop some action steps. What does that mean, we? You mean the network, you mean the individuals that we work for? Uh, and so we started with some of these action area strands. City government, green schoolyards, nature-based learning research, next-gen leadership, grassroots leadership, health professionals. But also knowing that, referring to the herb, to what I read, it isn't just about the separation of distinction between these groups. Stuff is happening between them. Stuff's happening that overlaps them and that connects them. The work that is happening within screen, green schoolyards affects, obviously, city policy, or it can, and it should go both ways. If you're a grassroots leader, you're not defined by a certain age or a certain space in which you operate, meaning your work isn't happening in a schoolyard. It doesn't mean then, therefore, because you're next gen, uh, you're at disadvantage in how your voice is included. You've always been wanting to be given that space, and you, by definition, are a grassroots leader yourself. And so there are different ways that we were trying to uh, make that work. And one of the ways was to try to map this out. What does it look like? Not just you as individuals here in this room or when you go back and you think, how am I actually connected to everybody here? 
Maybe I can enter the name into my email directory and see who pops up. What do those relationships between us look like? Because we need to be mindful that when we go back, you're going back not just as an individual, but as a collection of relationships with each other. But to remember that sometimes can be difficult. So we're working on the tools to try to show that. I can go there and look at myself or look at somebody else and see how as a network within all of these different action areas or collections, we all exist in relationship. And that's the power that we always need to be aware and mindful of. But to operate in those, in those networks, as you remember from this morning's uh, plenary, is about being open to what is intuitive or should be intuitive, but maybe it's not intuitive when we begin to practice it. To check yourselves, bring awareness, to say, am I actually putting mission before organization when I enter into this interaction? When we write that grant? When we work together? When I say I need help? Am I actually operating from a level of trust and humility? Or is something else affecting that relationship? Am I literally afraid that to think that I don't want to help or work with somebody else because I'm mistrustful. I realize that I have been putting brand and self-promotion over the humility and elevation of others. Because if we do that, then we are going to have a nice sky full of stars, but we're still going to keep missing the constellations. And that's our loss. Data makes us credible, but stories make us memorable. Something that came across all areas was this question of research and data. We need to have the information that allows us to make our case for why professional organizations, so that we continue to be more and more in alignment. So that question of change came up a lot. Looking at how it's a change for the better, but also some of the changes that need to happen in the physical and social infrastructure that just came up as barriers. Nature is a question of rights, it's a question of justice. Some uh, strands and groups I think were ready to just be clear about it and say this is straight up environmental, or social, or nature justice. And that came up in a lot of other conversations about how do we talk about access, the right to nature, to be as given as any other type of right that we strive for. Not just a nice to have. We can talk about, you may be familiar with questions like health justice, food justice. Uh, but often when we think about nature justice, it might be new terminology in a lot of areas. But diff different uh, strands we're talking about, you know, even, for example, talking about well, in the Constitution, it says a right to happiness. At least that's what I, one of the things that I heard. And happiness should be being able to live in a healthy, green environment. How does that reflect, reflect in the policies? Different uh, groups of you listed the Outdoor Bill of Rights, for example, uh, and saying, what does that look like? Uh, how is that implemented across different states? How is that more than just a statement? And the long and winding road. You can hum that one, too. Moving forward, there were different themes that, that came up. And the themes range everything from statements. Several, several strands were looking at what's the statement that we make. Everything from what is our manifesto to uh, what is the action agenda for the schoolyards that we sign, that we pledge. What are we rallying behind? Uh, I believe it was the research-based uh, group that says we want an Oakland, Oakland decoration to state this is what we're moving behind. So statement became uh, a common strand. So it's interesting to see moving forward what is the statement that people feel they're going to rally behind between now and the next summit, the next conference, and then moving forward. Funding, of course, never goes away. That was clear across all the strands. 
saying, how do we get the funding for this change? How do we get the funding for that policy? How do we transparent in uh, where funding goes to different organizations? So all that one also doesn't go away. But regardless of the path, it's one line with nature. It's one that even though it might be winding, and you're not sure how long it's going to be, just as some of you started uh, yesterday wondering where are we going with this process? What does the end actually look like? But something that actually research also shows us that curves, especially curves in parks, like a little trail, it's adaptive for us humans. It, meaning that evolutionary speaking, it gives us just enough to wonder and be excited about what's right around the turn, but we don't know what it is. And so we actually when you design parks in that way, that's what makes good parks. It gives us just enough to feel safe, and it's not right around the corner, it's right around the corner over there, but enough excitement and wonder. And so that final question of wonder and exploration I think it's something that dominated a one over anxiety and uncertainty from all the strands. As we were trying to get all of your takeaways uh, and wondering, like, what does this look like? Where are we going? I think that key vision from the beginning was still guiding all of you, and that you were excited. And everything that we can talk about specific action areas like research generation, uh, how do we incorporate unheard and unseen voices, to how do we develop a toolkit, do we develop a parent engagement surveys, how are we addressing language, how are we addressing barriers for access to network and resources, um, right down to uh, the question of um, who are we. At the end of the day, the final takeaway that I got from this that was very clear was this question of connection. So we're still moving and we're ending with where we're starting. Across all the strands, connection was another clear thing that I think will keep us driving forward. Connection with each other, practitioner to practitioner. Connection from practitioner to researcher. From healthcare professional to community leader. From families and communities to nature. From city leaders um, to grassroots leaders. And so even though we have a lot to do, I think the exciting part was that you're all excited and motivated in moving there. Um, and that you're a lot more aware that on that winding road, you need to invite more people, you need to look at who's walking with you. And I'm going to close by quoting Juan, or paraphrasing him. As he often says, this idea of familia is not always who's directly related to you. It's not necessarily a bloodline. It's who's walking with you. Who is walking that path with you and fighting that fight? And if you can remember that takeaway from the start about who family is, to be inclusive of each other as individuals, but also um, all our relations, I think that's what's going to make us succeed. And so with that, uh, I want to thank you, because we do have more work to do. But I think there was a commonality in, in a lot of things that united, united us between us. So I'm excited, and you'll get to hear more about how this is all going to come together. So thank you for that.